Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to class. Uh, we are going to continue our study on the book of Titus. Uh, last week, we began looking at, we studied chapter one, we began studying chapter two, uh, two verse eight. And so today we'll uh, continue with chapter two, where we look at the instructions that uh, Paul is writing to Titus uh, regarding the bond servants in the church. Uh, before we begin, can one of you please lead us in prayer, please? Anyone? Zelatoni, can I ask you to lead us in prayer, please? Sure, Pastor. Let's pray. Father God, we come before your presence in the name of Jesus. We thank you so much for this time to have our class today. You bless Pastor uh, Selena as she teaches the word from your uh, from your word. Lord, also bless each one of us. Uh, Lord, give us your insight and understanding. Holy Spirit, you guide us, lead us throughout the intercession, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Zelatoli. So we'll begin studying uh, Chapter 2, verses 9 uh, onwards. So can one of you please read verses 9 to 13 of Titus chapter 2, please? Titus chapter 2. Verses uh, 9 to 13. Exhort bond servants to be obedient to their own masters, to be well pleasing in all things, not answering back, not referring, but showing all good fidelity, that they may atone the doctrine of God our Savior and our things. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, verse 14 as well, Jeffina. Thank you. Oh, Pastor. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Should I finish? Yeah, thank you. Amen. Thank you. So in verses 9 to 10, uh, Paul is writing to uh, Titus and he is giving him instructions for the bond servants in the church. He's exhorting the bond servants to be obedient to their masters. Uh, and Titus was to teach bond servants, bond servants basically slaves. I've explained to you what's the meaning of bond servants about their specific duties as Christians. Um, We've, I've also explained this when we were studying um, uh, Timothy, so I'm not going to be explaining in detail, but um, just that, you know, in in the church context, uh, in the uh, in the church, uh, basically uh, masters and slaves used to worship together. And this was kind of a, uh, you know, big cultural shock to people, uh, I mean, to the world around them because uh, you know slaves and masters together in a social setting at a church service um, but this was something that you know god was teaching through the church uh, to the world around not to differentiate between slaves and free men uh, so paul gives five ways that slaves were to relate to their uh, masters uh, now since they were believers the slaves uh, they can't take advantage of their masters, but uh, he gives five ways that slaves were to relate to their masters. Uh, but when we look at it in our context, uh, it's not only for slaves, but everyone as, uh, you know, all of us as Christian employees, uh, what are the kind of uh, uh, qualities we need to exhibit or we need to showcase in the workplace. So he, he says that, you know, uh, slaves or those who of us are employees in the workplace, we need to be obedient to our masters. Uh, basically here, you know, um, Paul is saying that those, these bond servants had an obligation 
uh, to their masters. They were supposed to be obedient to them. And this word obedient uh, is basically describing a company of soldiers or a group of soldiers were standing at attention and saluting their uh, commander. And when they're doing that, they're basically telling or declaring to their commander that they are, you know, here right in front of them, uh, sorry, right in front of him uh, to take on any orders that he has for them. The second thing he says is that, you know, slaves should be well pleasing in all things, you know, have a cheerful attitude in the way they serve their masters in every way. They need to have a cheerful attitude. Uh, and he says in everything, in all things, that means in everything, they need to require uh, to be obedient to their master uh, in every area. Uh, you know, they need to submit, they need to surrender, uh, they need to be obedient, they be, need to be responsible to their masters. But if their masters tell them to do something that is not in accordance with what God has uh, established in his word or the commandments of God, it's going against God's moral uh, or righteous laws or values, then, you know, you're not supposed to, uh, you know, uh, obey our earthly masters. But in all things, we obey them. But if they ask us to do things that are going against what God has commanded us, according to his righteous laws and his moral standards, then we don't do it. So, for example, if you're a Christian employee and your manager or your uh, employer, you know, ask you to lie or to engage in dishonest accounting practices, then you don't obey them. You don't submit to them in that uh, area. As long as, you know, they are um, asking you to do what uh, is pleasing in God's sight, then you, you know, uh, you obey them. But if it does not uh, please what God is asking you to do, it's not according to his moral righteous standards, then you shouldn't be submitting or obeying your earthly masters or your employer. Okay. And uh, we also see that he says, you know, you should not back answer. I've explained quite a bit of this when we were studying First Timothy chapter 6, where Paul is writing to Timothy about how bond servants have to relate to uh, their masters who are also Christians. So I'm not going to go into much detail because I've explained uh, there in much detail. They should not answer back. They should not you know, uh, backbite, they should not talk behind their back, they should not, uh, you know, uh, 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 argue with them. Uh, this is not showing a subordination or this is not uh, pleasing in God's sight. And then the fourth thing he says, not pilfering. Now, pilfer means, uh, you know, to uh, misappropriate uh, or steal or cheat or take away money or goods, uh, you know, that belongs to their masters. Now, you know, slaves were often entrusted with some money to make some purchases or supplies for the household. And they had this uh, rational, you know, uh, what if I just take a little money? It's not going to... Um, you know, harm my master. If they are so rich, they have so much of money. Uh, if I steal from them or if I take a little from them, it's it's not going to pinch them in any way. It's not going to, uh, you know, cause them any problem. Anyway, they're living in a luxury. So this is the kind of the mindset that slaves had. And so in the ancient world, sometimes the words uh, servant and thief, servants and thief were used interchangeably. Uh, because it was assumed <coughs> that these uh, slaves or servants would steal from their masters in these small ways. So they used to use thief and uh, servant or slave, you know, they used to use these words interchangeably. Uh, so for us also as well, you know, as employees, sometimes it's very easy to use the same kind of rational. You know, when we take away from the company, uh, especially larger companies or the government companies where we say, hey, you know, if I take away some money, even in ministry, if I take away some of the uh, money that people give and tithes and offerings, uh, it's not going to pinch God. It's not going to pinch the church because this church is so rich. There's so much of money, you know, uh, it's not going to do anyone any harm. And I think that is, uh, I think it is wrong. It is wrong in God's eyes, because that is stealing, that is uh, cheating, and that is uh, 
uh, are not honorable in God's sight. So, you know, if um, uh, if you're using, for example, you're traveling, you know, and you and uh, the office or the church gives you the the privilege of claiming those expenses, then you take exactly what you have spent and uh, not extra thinking that hey, you know, I can do that. The church is rich or uh, uh, my employer is rich or this organization is rich and it's not going to harm them or pinch them in any way if I take away a little money. So is, that is non, uh, not pilfering. And the fifth one is not but showing all fidelity. Okay. Um, a fidelity, this phrase basically means to act faithfully or ev uh, in every possible occasion, in all possible ways you know, to act faithfully uh, without using fraud or causing injury or uh, doing wrong transactions uh, or involving in wrong, in wrong transactions with their uh, masters. So as a slave or as an employee, you know, we must act faithfully in all affairs, um, you know, of their master and not cheat them because ultimately we're serving God, not man. Uh, we are responsible to God, not man. We are answerable to God, not man, because we are serving him and he is watching over us. Okay. Now, why is Paul mentioning all of these things? Was so that, you know, uh, the believer slaves will stand out from the rest of the slaves in the world. Um, uh, you know, of course, the slaves did not like the fact that they were slaves. And they used to fight back, uh, you know, uh, or they would fight back for their freedom. Uh, they would show a wrong attitude. They would show, uh, you know, bad moods or bad temper. Uh, they would speak wrong uh, uh, in a rude, disrespectful way to their masters, steal from their masters, and would try to get away by doing all of these things. But Paul is saying that, you know, as believers, slaves, don't do these things you know, uh, set an example. And, uh, you know, uh, what would be uh, the result if you live uh, like this? What would be the result if you uh, are faithful, if you obey your masters, if you don't cheat them, if you honor them, if you don't uh, backbite uh, behind them? It says that they may adorn the doctrine of God as Savior in all things. So Paul base uses this word adorn in a very beautiful way because the word adorn is used of the setting of jewels. You know, it means arranging uh, precious jewels in a very orderly, precise, uh, neat, skillful way that would bring about the beauty uh, of each gem, of each precious stone, and would just, uh, you know, enhance the whole piece in in a very uh, intricate, in a very execute, uh, uh, in a very beautiful uh, way. So, uh, in the same way, Paul says that as Christians, we should order our lives with such godly behavior that we will be like that uh, jewel uh, piece, you know, that uh, 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 we will, you know, just uh, radiate the beauty of each of those gems, those precious stones in such a beautiful way that the world will be attracted uh, to our uh, Savior. So if you look at, uh, uh, you know, beautiful jewelry pieces, it's because of the way that they are designed, the way they are arranged, the way those precious stones are just uh, beautifully arranged in a very skillful, uh, beautiful way. And that enhances the whole a piece of uh, jewelry. So he's saying that when you live godly lives, godly behavior, the world will be attracted to the uh, Savior. So the life ministry and uh, the saving work of Jesus or God our Savior will be uh, put on exhibition, you know, with all of its beauty uh, to the unbelieving world by a person uh, uh, who has a godly character and a godly conduct. So you see how important it is to have a godly character and a godly conduct. Um, we often think that, you know, um, it's the way we preach, it's the way we teach, it's, um, it's our style, it's our charisma, you know, uh, that adorns the gospel. Yes, uh, it is important to preach and teach well and to be prepared and um, uh, 
uh, you know, to uh, to teach in um, in a way that people can understand. Uh, also enhance our language skills, our preaching skills, interpretation skills, all that is important. But what really matters is what really stands out is our lives. When our lives um, are the, that well piece that uh, really, you know, uh, adorn the, the person work and uh, the ministry and the saving work of Jesus Christ, you know, people accept the gospel in a real quicker way. So our lives uh, speak volumes. So in this context, you know, the bond servants who were slaves were brought with money and, you know, um, and of course they are treated like animals. They don't have any freedom. They don't have any rights. Uh, but it's God's design that these people, even in their lowly position, have the potential to, uh, you know, beautify God's truth, beautify God's doctrines, uh, in the way that they live. Isn't that beautiful? So we might be nobodies, we might be not great preachers, uh, great apostles, great teachers, you know, great men and women of God. We might not, people would not even know who we are. But, you know, even in our lowly position, wherever God has called us, whatever, wherever he's placed us to be, you know, we have the potential to beautify God's truth in the way that we live. Excuse me. Sorry, I'm having a bad uh, chest infection. So what does it mean? Uh, this means that we need to think about our behavior. We need to think about our attitude, uh, especially, uh, you know, the workplace, um, how, what will others think about the God that we serve, the God that we worship, uh, the savior that we profess to follow. And if our life is not an example of godliness, as Paul is reiterating here, or mentioning it here, or spelling out here, then I think it's good not to let anyone know that we are a Christian. Because if we do, we'll basically be blaspheming the name of God. We will be bringing dishonor to the name of Christ. And unbelievers will continue to uh, you know, live in a sinful manner uh, we would never be able to show them that they can live sinless, they can overcome temptation, they can do what is right and honoring in God's sight. And it will, our lives will, you know, will be an excuse for them to live in sin. You know, uh, we who profess to know the true and living God, God who died for our sins, God who set us free from the power of sin, death, and Satan, if we continue to live in sin, then the unbelievers will have all the more excuses to make uh, for their sin and continue to live in uh, sin. Any uh, questions on verses 9 to 10? Any questions? Okay, we'll move on to verses 11 to 14. Um, uh, we've already read this, so I'm not going to ask any of you to read it. But verse 11 says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Okay, So God's grace brings salvation to all men. And it means here to all kinds of people, to all types of people, including those whom the world despises, even the slaves. No one is beyond or outside the reach of God's grace. Amen? You know, those of you praying for your loved ones, um, can know that no one is outside or beyond the reach of God's grace. And, um, you know, the grace of God brings salvation, which again goes on to mean to say, which I've already explained, that this does not mean that all people will be automatically saved, you know, but only those who accept the grace of God, those who believe in the Son of God. But the good news is that the grace of God uh, or the good news of God's grace is that no sinner is beyond the reach of God's uh, grace. Okay, and that is why Paul calls himself as the being one who was the chief of sinners. He mentions this is in uh, in First Timothy chapter one, verses thirteen and verse fifteen. 
he says that you know i being the greatest of sinners or the chief of sinners you know but he says i experienced the grace of god through the cross so if the chief of sinners could experience the grace of god so can everyone and then he says the grace of god that brings uh, salvation um so it's the grace of God that brings salvation to us and we have the opportunity to receive it, okay? Verse 12 says, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. So teaching us that. Now the ancient Greek word for teaching basically has in mind what a parent does for a child. Uh, it speaks of the entire training process. You know, the training process is the, the parent teaches, encourages, again corrects, disciplines, again teaches, encourages, corrects, disciplines. So it's a cycle, okay? So uh, here, that is what it has in mind about teaching. Teaching is not just imparting and leaving, but teaching, encouraging, correcting, and disciplining, and the cycle goes on. So grace is a teacher in that uh, sense. So the Greek word here for teaching means basically uh, discipling us. The Passion Translation says, His same grace teaches us how to live each day. His same grace teaches us how to live each day. His same grace means that the grace of God that brings salvation or the grace of God that has brought us salvation, the same grace teaches us how we need to live each day. And this is a process that begins at salvation and continues until we stand face to face before the Lord. But note, <coughs> sorry. But we need to note that grace does not mean live as you wish or desire, but rather grace trains us. It teaches us, encourages us, corrects us, and disciplines us, and instructs us in godly living. So this is another uh, attribute or a facet uh, that grace does. Grace uh, disciplines us, grace instructs us in godly living. And then Paul mentions three ways that grace trains us. Uh, the first one is that grace trains us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. So when you experience God's unmerited favor in Christ Jesus, it basically motivates us to want to please him in everything that we uh, do. So as you read God's word, you realize that you know, there's so much uh, in your life that uh, is dishonoring God, it's going against God's will, you're living in willful disobedience, and what is breaking the heart of God, what is, uh, you know, grieving uh, uh, the spirit of God that is living in you. And, uh, you know, it's what is displeasing the Lord who gave himself up uh, on the cross to save you from sin, and to bring you eternal life, to bring you salvation. And then you begin to, you know, uh, confess your sins. You begin to correct yourself. And then you also deny yourself daily and you take up your cross and you follow him like we read in Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Okay? And uh, grace also trains us to say no to ungodliness. Okay? This refers basically to a person who is uh, immoral, living an immoral life, um, uh, a life that is uh, away from God, uh, full of evil. Uh, but uh, it also includes the person who's, you know, outwardly looking very righteous or behaving very righteous, behaving very holy, but uh, deep down has no place for God in their life. Okay. Uh, and these kind of people, you know, in their everyday life, they are motivated by their sinful desires, their sinful passions. Uh, uh, it's their I, me, myself that is ruling them, and there is no place for God. 
Now, the person who has tasted God's grace will say no to such ungodly living. Okay, so a person who's tasted the love of God, the salvation of God, the grace of God uh, would, you know, say no to such um, ungodly or godless living. The second one that Paul mentions, uh, grace trains us, is grace trains us to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Um, it's just not enough for us to say no to ungodliness and worldly desires. We must also say yes to living a righteous, a holy, a blameless, a godly life so that, you know, just like Paul tells the slaves, you know, so that the world around us will be drawn to our Savior. Okay, the world around us will know how uh, the God that we serve will be attracted to our Savior, even as they look at how we live in the workplace, how we conduct ourselves in the workplace. Now here it says, grace trains us to live <coughs> sensibly. Sensibly refers to how we are to exercise self-control over ourselves. You know, self-control in every area of our lives. So um, righteous living has to do with, you know, us living a life of integrity, honesty, uh, uprightness in, the, in our dealings with others. And also godly here refers to our love and reverence towards God. It basically denotes holiness in the way we think, act, react, in our attitudes, in our uh, uh, nature, um, in the way we walk, in the way we talk. So uh, godly refers uh, to our love and reference towards God. Righteously has to do with living our life of integrity and uprightness in our dealings with others. And uh, then he says, uh, and godly in this present age. So living in a godly manner, you know, uh, godly basically means living in a godly manner according to the word and the will of God, living in total submission and surrender and obedience to the word of God, to the will of God, both in secret and in a public, both in public and in private, so that God can be glorified. Any questions so far before we move on to verse 13 and we look at uh, the third way that grace trains us? Any questions? All of you with me? Okay, sure, you. I'll just suck on a lozenge so that my uh, I don't cough and my throat gets clear. The third way that grace trains us is grace trains us to live in godliness by looking ahead and behind. Verses um, uh, 13 and the first half of verse 14. So verse 13 says, looking for the blessed hope and glorious reappearing of our God, our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the first half of verse 14 says, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless uh, deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. So here we see the third way that grace trains us is grace trains us to live in godliness by looking ahead and behind. So the forward look is, you know, uh, is looking towards grace trains us to look towards the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The backward look is, um, is to basically look at back at the cross and the implications on our own life. So the forward look is looking ahead at the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And the backward look is basically looking at the cross and what can be the implications in our lives. So we look at the 
forward look first and then we we'll look at the backward looks the forward look looking ahead to the blessed hope of christ second coming which is um, which he writes in verse 13. now you know god's grace instructs us to look for the blessed hope and the appearing of our glorious and our great god and our savior uh, jesus christ Christ's first appearing, yes, was in grace. It brought salvation uh, to all of us. It redeemed us from sin, from Satan, and from death, and brought us eternal hope, eternal life, uh, brought us salvation. And this was during his first, his first coming. Um, but during his first coming, his glory was you know, uh, wailed, which means that uh, uh, we know through John chapter 17 that Jesus manifested the, um, the sonship glory. He did not manifest the glory that he had of God. And that is why he says in, in, in John chapter 17, he tells his father, now, you know, give me back the glory that I had even before the foundation of time. Because I finished the work, I'm coming back uh, to you. Uh, so Jesus, when he walked on the earth, he did not manifest his um, glory of deity or glory of being God. Because if he manifested that, you know, we could not um, see him. We could not experience uh, a God in a tangible way. We could not even, uh, you know, um, uh, know the Father that was revealed through the Son. And of course, we could not crucify him on the uh, cross. Uh, so Jesus laid aside his glory of deity of God, and he took on uh, the date, the sonship glory, and that is why we were able to, you know, uh, uh, touch him, see him in a very tangible, in a very real way. But at his second coming, second appearing. We will see him in all of his glory, and he will bring salvation to his people, but he will terrify the people who have not believed in him uh, with a terrifying judgment. And so there will be a terrifying judgment for those who have not believed in him. Uh, and this you know, second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is our blessed hope, where we will fully experience all of the blessings of his salvation even as we uh, experience it in part just like i said a few uh, classes back that when we are born again yes we receive eternal life um even though it's a futuristic hope even if it's, even if it's a eschatological hope somewhere a future hope that we have but it's a realized eschatology in the sense that we realize that eternal life, that hope here and uh, now. So if our focus is set on Christ's return and the hope that he is going to return, uh, we will purify our life from every known sin, as we read in 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Can someone read that, please? Can someone please read 1 John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3? Anyone can read 1 John chapter 3, verses uh, 2 and 1 John chapter 3, verses. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, he shall be like him, for we shall, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone, who has this hope in him, purifies himself just as he is pure. Amen. Amen. So it says here that, you know, thank you, Lubega. It says here that, you know, even as we have this hope, this uh, return of Christ, you know, we will purify ourselves just like he is pure and uh, holy. So, you know, uh, everyone is talking about the second coming of God. There's so many 
YouTube videos, this is happening, that is happening, crisis coming, you know, soon, and all of those things. And all of us are so anxious, all of us are so worried. And we're all thinking, you know, when is the day that he's coming? Uh, the April 8th is uh, going to be a solar eclipse. And, you know, uh, there's so many things that have been said, and Christians are like uh, thinking that it's going to be. Uh, it's the beginning of end of time and they're storing up food and all of those stuff and videos saying don't do that it's not the truth you know but what should be our focus you know not just uh yes we need to discern the times we need to know the times we're living but that should lead us to a quickening in our inner man to share the gospel with those who are lost those who have not known uh the Lord and Savior, because when he comes, there'll be a terrifying judgment for them. He's not coming till everyone has heard the gospel. So it's our responsibility to do that. And also it's our great responsibility to purify our life from every known sin. Because if we um, truly believe in the Son of God, if we truly believe what he's done on the cross for us, then we should purify our life from every known sin. So even as Paul is writing this to Titus way back, you know, in for the early church, it's so relevant for our time, you know, writing to bond servants so relevant to us as employees, um, not talking about the grace of God, so relevant to us and how we need to uh, train ourselves to live in godliness by looking ahead and behind and how we need to um, how the grace of God, you know, helps us to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And the call of this time is not just to know when God is coming, what are the signs to read about it and to keep on pondering about it and talking about it, but to tell people that, hey, it's time to live sensibly. You know, uh, sensibly means, you know, to exercise self-control. It's time to live righteously. It's time to live godly in this present age. And it's also time, you know, that uh, where we are um, purifying our lives from every known sin and every unknown sin, which the Holy Spirit will also point out to us. Verse 14, can one of you read verse 14, please? Who give him Go ahead, Lopega. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works? Speak these things, exalt and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Amen. Thank you, Lubega. So here we um, see the uh, forward look we saw was looking ahead at the coming of uh, the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is what grace uh, trains us to do. And also grace trains us to look back, to look back at the demonstration of God's love on the cross uh, by which he redeemed us from sin and made us his own possession. Says that, you know, who here, who refers back to our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us. And so who is this who that um, gave himself for us? It is Jesus. And what is the gift that he gave us? You know, he gave us his, uh, he gave us himself. So it says here, who gave himself. So himself is the gift that he has given us. And who did he give himself for? He gave himself uh, up for us. Okay. So the person for whom he gave himself up was for us. So first Christ gave himself for us uh, so that he can redeem us from every lawless Deed. And we already know what's the meaning of redeem. I've already explained that, you know, basically redeem is, um, you know, uh, Paul uses this word very beautifully here in this context because um, he has just finished talking to bond servants or bond slaves. And um, 
you know, um, uh, redeem would have got the attention of these uh, slaves because uh, the word redeem is basically used to purchase out of a slave market or buy out of a slave market. So, so what is that's used of buying a slave out of a market uh, so as to give him freedom. So before we met Christ, so before we were in Christ, or before we were part of God's family, we were all slaves of sin. And Christ purchased us out of that slave market of sin and set us free. He paid the redemption price uh, by uh, you know, shedding his own blood. He freed us from bondage of sin. Then how can, you know, as believers, we go back to being slaves of sin? Just like we studied in Romans when Paul talks so much about this, you know, when we have been set free, when, you know, God has liberated us, how can we, you know, continue living in sin? Because we are dead to sin. Um, the power of sin is broken over our lives. We have the nature of uh, God operating in and through our lives. That's what we studied in uh, Romans. So, you know, when we have been purchased out and free, you know, I'm sure a slave who's purchased as a slave market and free would not say, I want to go back to the slave market. He would never do that. So how then, you know, can we as believers go back into the slavery of sin? The second thing is Christ gave himself up for us that he might purify uh, for himself a people with his own, to be his own special uh, people. So verse 12, you know, uh, focus on our need to purify ourselves. But verse 14 focuses on Christ purifying us through his blood. We studied that in verse 12, right? Mm, where we need to purify ourselves from every known sin. And so here in verse um, 14, you know, uh, the focus here is Christ who purified us through his own Blood. He bought us from the slave market of sin. He washed us from our sins. And now we belong uh, to him as his personal or his prized possession. We are his. We are his sons and daughters. We belong to the family of God. We belong to the kingdom of God. The third thing that grace trains us is grace trains us, um, uh, those trains those who are saved to be zealous for good deeds, the, the latter part of verse uh, 14. Zealous is basically doing and promoting good works. Um, so these good deeds are done, uh, you know, not because we want to get a place in heaven, not because we want to earn our salvation, we can't earn our salvation, not because our sins will be covered, nothing can cover our sins but the blood of Jesus and the forgiveness that we can claim in the blood of the Lamb. Um, in confessing our sins to Jesus. But act here, good deeds refers to deeds that are done out of sincere love for God and others in obedience to his word. So doing everything not of, out of compulsion, but doing it out of sincere love for God and for others because we want to obey God, because it is his will that we act in love, that we do things in love, that we react in love. So if you've been brought out of the slave market of sin by the blood of our great God and Savior, then we should be zealous for good deeds and, uh, and we ought to be totally devoted to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So three beautiful uh, ways that grace trains us. That we see in um, you know uh, verses uh, thirteen and verse fourteen. Any questions? Any questions? Okay. If not, we'll move on to the last verse in this chapter two, verse fifteen. Can one of you please read that, please? Speak these things. So, 
exalt and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Amen. Thank you, Lubega. So Paul's words speak, exhort, and reproof. You know, uh, basically is indicating mm, the different approaches that are needed with different people. You know, Paul is telling Titus that with some people, all you need to do is, you know, just tell them a word and they'll get back on the right path. For others, you need to give strong exhortation. And for others, you know, you need to convince them or convict them of their wrong. But Paul is saying, irrespective of where people are, he's urging Titus to teach, exhort, and reprove, um, you know, uh, what everything what he has shared with him, uh, you know, in uh, in the last few verses or in the in his letter that he's uh, writing to him. Now, the word exhort in Greek basically means parakelio, uh, which means press in with much earnestness. So, you know, as a minister, uh, you know, and as people who are also preaching and teaching God's word, you know, uh, we must not be cold and lifeless in the way we deliver God's doctrines uh, as if they were just simple, ordinary things. But we need to, you know, or we must urge them with eagerness and with importance, showing the importance, the priority that should be given and the earnestness in which it needs to be taken on and dealt with and lived on. So uh, as preachers, Paul is telling uh, Titus that he must call people not to be only hearers of the word, but also doers so that they may be blessed. Okay. Now, this word exhort is also a word that is related uh, to a word used of the Holy Spirit. Uh, you know, Holy, uh, the Holy Spirit is referred to as a parakletos. So the, the word exhort is para, the Greek word is parakelio. And Holy Spirit is also referred to as a parakletos, which means somebody who comes alongside us for our as assistance. Somebody who comes alongside to assist us, help us, aid us, counsel us, encourage us, teach us, guide us, reveal the truth to us. So the thought of coming alongside someone, uh, what they're do, uh, uh, doing wrong, to assist them, you know, back to doing what is uh, right. So uh, this might be the, uh, you know, the thought behind why he says exhort. Uh, those who do not know the truth or those who are not acting upon the truth. He's telling Titus, you need to come along them just like the Holy Spirit comes alongside us for assistance <coughs> so that we assist them back into doing what is right. And then he uses the word rebuke. So some, with some people you have to rebuke. Um, uh, how Who do you rebuke if somebody knows the truth and is not acting on the truth, but acting against the truth, you know, uh, you need to give them a, a rebuke or you attempt to bring them up to realize their position and the need for changing their position and the need for them to do the right thing. It also, uh, you know, relates to conviction, uh, bringing one to conviction with words. And then he says with authority, you know, Paul had all the authority uh, that he had in the church at that time, but he's extending this authority to Titus as well. And he's saying, Titus, use every bit of that authority. And then he says, let no one despise you. So what Paul is telling Titus is let no one disregard you, means let no one despise you. Titus, be such an example, be that adorning uh, jewel piece, a beautiful piece, you know, uh, live such a life, an example of godliness and good deeds, uh, what he has been mentioning in verses 7 and 8, that people will not be able to disregard your message or the truth or the doctrines or, you know, the exhortation or the rebuke or the correction, the conviction that you're giving them. They will not challenge that. They will not disregard your message because they know that your life backs it up. And so that's how he ends chapter 2. 
Okay, we are done with our um, time for the first class. Uh, we'll take a break now and we'll come back and we'll begin with any questions if you have, and then we'll move on to chapter three. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>